Good morning, and welcome to this morning's church service. Thank you for joining us all. I uh, trust that you had a good week and that you are ready to gather together and worship God together. Um, quick announcement. Uh, it's just the offerings can be sent to the church. You can mail them to Box 115, or you can e-transfer them. If you have any questions at all, feel free to call the office or go and look on the website. Let's pause for a moment of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for another chance to get together and worship you, Lord, to serve you in any way we can, and to reflect upon you, Lord, and what you are trying to teach us and speak to us, Lord. Please bless the offerings, and please bless those that are giving it, Lord, that they give it with a joyful heart. In Jesus' name, amen. This morning's scripture reading is 1 Timothy 6, 6 through 10, and then 17 and, or through 19. But godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into this world, and we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing, with these we will be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into, content, into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future, so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. Thank you very much, Arthur. I really appreciate that. Good morning, church. Uh, it's a great blessing to be together, because we're well, not, but the day is coming, you know, when we will be. Uh, it'll be nice, won't it, to, um, to walk to the store, be ready at the front door, only to find out you forgot your mask. Have you done that once yet? Yeah, I've, I've only done it once, so that's pretty good for me, but... There's um, all kinds of new negotiations these days, and it's, I just have that suspicion that it might not change for us um, for another little while yet. Just have that. I'm hoping I'm wrong, but uh, we need to just uh, uh, be vigilant, don't we, in these days, and be careful with one another and make sure we look after one another, being looking out for one another too, isn't it? But just let's, um, let's just open in a word of prayer for the rest of our morning service. Our Heavenly Father, we just want to say thank you so much that you have blessed us with, um, with so much to enjoy, the very fact that in this day we can electronically um, be able to bless one another. I pray, Father, that the church, when they, uh, when they come together and, 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 and join us uh, on the Sunday morning, uh, that there will be a worship um, that they know, Lord, you're present, that there will be a, um, a, a message that your Holy Spirit will teach each one of us. Uh, and I just pray, Father, just that you will just anoint every part of this service in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, it's good for us to be reminded of things, and you, you get to be reminded every week about probably two things, most certainly. Number one is about giving, and the other is about praying. And, uh, you know, so I want to make sure that it doesn't become just like, you know, you get so used to something getting said and you just ignore it. Uh, and the worst thing, of course, about it now being uh, video is that you can fast forward through these things. Um, but I do want to just remind you and to, to remember that um, giving is, of course, is, is a worship, isn't it? And it just loads of things that still needs to be obviously paid for. And so we just want to encourage you just to, again, remind them. Write it on your, the back of your hand or whatever. They continue to keep giving um, as, your, you know, as your, your responsibility before God to do so. Um, but praying, of course, is, 
It is also a bit of a discipline, isn't it? You know, to be able to set time aside. I don't know if you've been able to do this or not. I hope, really hope you have, is that on a Sunday morning that you actually can pause and just ask one another, what are the things that we've neglected to maybe pray for during the week? And just stop. Uh, get a pen, get a blank sheet of paper and just write out a few things uh, and just spend a few minutes in prayer. It really calls the heart, isn't it, to be a place of where we are, we are focused away, the focus is away from ourselves and that's always good, isn't it? Um, so he has most certainly blessed us with so much. But there are those in our church who are struggling a little bit more. Uh, so, so please just be aware that we are... A church, we, Scripture says that we, um, we rejoice together, uh, but we also weep together too, isn't it? That's what it really means to be a, a one-body church who identify, of course, with Christ as the head. And um, so let's not just go through the motions, but make sure that our hearts are touched by the realities of that we are brothers and sisters in Christ and we have a Lord over us. So let's just buy and pray for just a few things that we've been praying for every week already that those of whom God has brought us into a ministry partnership with. Our Heavenly Father, we just want to come together and pray, Lord, that your name would be glorified, Lord. Um, we know that there's a whole range of confusions and a whole range of disquieted hearts these days because of the media and um, the things that are going on in this land and all across North America and all across the world. We know that the, the default center of, the man, of a man's heart is, is disruption and rebellion. And of course, Lord, it's the grace of the gospel that in your mercy that you would bring this gospel and that you would save some, O oh God, and that you, by, your, um, f- uh, by a faithful church, that we would take a glorious gospel and that we would stand up in this day. For we know that the eternal things have far more significance and consequence in, times, in terms of eternity than the things that we experience just in time. We want to lift up to you, Daryl and Cindy Hartwig, Lord, and we just want to thank you for the news that they've received, that they might be able to resume their services on the, from the 17th of January on way. So I just, just thank you so much for that grace you've provided for them. And we just ask that you would, again, just encourage them by this, to know that they are not the Lord of the harvest you are, uh, and that we are servants answerable to you. It's a, a wonderful, the wonderful grace for us is that it's all not absolutely down to us. You are the Lord and you've called us not just as um, individual servants who lead, but for your whole church to minister together. So I pray you would raise up a whole army, Lord, to um, take ownership of the ministry um, there in Ontario. Um, encourage them, uh, bless them as they're able to meet back together uh, soon. And um, I pray you would just bring people out. We know that you've been working on people's hearts in these days. People are discouraged. Uh, lack of human touch. But I pray, Father, just that it's an awful lot more than just human touch. But, but they actually can experience um, the God of all creation who brings a gracious gospel to touch the heart and where the Holy Spirit can enter their lives. We want to just lift up to you again, Gordon, Lord, uh, and, and Anna, um, we just want to continue to pray for Gordon's cancer treatments. We just, we thank you for him. Give him, again, a new sense and awareness that there's, he's got family all across the world who know him, love him, care for him. Do We just want to lift him up, Lord, before you. And for the any anxiety he might have for the ministries going on back in Honduras, um, I pray for those street feeding ministries and, and the mercy ministries and the gospel ministries going out that you would be merciful, Lord, to us and, and um, bring that provision that they so sorely need. Uh, again, we want to lift up Howard and Kathy, Lord, to you as they prepare for the summer coming up. 
We're hoping for much better things. The circumstances change. But God, we know that the gospel is never housed in some um, societal um, restriction. But we know, Father, your Holy Spirit just takes this. And, and if there's a way for us to bring the gospel to this lost world, God, equip us to do so. For our little flock, we just ask your blessing. We ask for those who are hurting for all kinds of reasons. Thank you so much, Lord, just for the knowledge that you are a God of all comfort. You comfort us. You comfort us through your word. You comfort us through the words of your, of your um, of brothers and sisters. You, you comfort us through the, just the very the blessing, Lord, that we pray for one another. But I pray, Father, in these days that all of us would be found looking up ways. We know that our help comes from you, O oh Lord. So we want to submit ourselves to you. Help us never to back down from love, never to back down from caring for one another, that we'd be constantly be, be more aware and more equipped that this is a ministry for all of us, a ministry of serving. For you've called us to be a serving community. Help us to fulfill that mandate in the name of Jesus. Amen. And Grant and his family are going to lead us in some songs of worship. Welcome, Calvary Baptist Church, and, and those joining us virtually. Um, let's worship our Lord and Savior, our mighty Lord and Savior. Let us worship Him together. Yeah. 
have done great things. You have done great things. Oh God, you do great
cast my mind to Calvary, where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. Amen. Thank you so much, the Weissners. Hope you've been really singing along with those songs. Even for the very fact that they go through so much practice and they work so hard, you know, it's really worthy um, just for sheer effort alone for us to remind ourselves to sing along. But the truth of the songs is even more important, isn't it? Uh, I just want to read the passage that we're going to be looking at this morning. And you know where we are, of course, isn't it? It's in Matthew. And um, Matthew chapter 6, it's just a few verses. Matthew 6, verse, um, verse 19 to 21. Now, I could have honestly preached from verse 19 to the end of 24, essentially talking about the same kind of issues, but I think it's genuinely worthwhile. I believe the, the Lord wants us to focus on these things. So it's really from verse 19 then to 21. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. 
But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in or steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Again, we come to a, a wonderful teaching of Jesus that has at its foundation a deep love and a profound wisdom. It's kind of Jesus' way of saying, I want you to have the fullest of all lives right now. As before his, his return, he wants all of us as his church to live the fullest, meaningfullest life. You see, Jesus knows what we need better than we know ourselves because he doesn't need anyone to testify concerning man for he himself knows what's in man John 2 and verse 25 Jesus says and because of that he'll say as the one full of grace and truth he'll say this what does it profit a man how will it profit you to gain the whole world and forfeit your soul. For what will a man give in exchange for his soul? He says in Mark chapter 8. You know and I know that it's possible to be practically addicted to stuff. At the same time, believing that there's a spiritual reality beyond the stuff. Happens all the time, doesn't it? Claims and practices, they get separated constantly. The misplaced value here is that if life is lived as if the material world is all there is, why would anyone, why would I be even concerned about anybody's restrictions on what I do with my treasure and if and where I store it up? Utilitarianism, which became a huge doctrine in the last couple of hundred years, is even more today, believe it or not, has no real foundation to demand anything I do. You know, laws are meaningless to a person when there is no ultimate lawgiver. Because if there's nothing beyond the funeral, then all there is is now. And the doctrine that actions are right only if they're useful for the benefit of a majority actually lacks potency, actually lacks any power whatsoever. When you know and I know that the emperor's got no clothes and that ought, things I should do, ultimately becomes laughable when we know that the guy next door believes in, you know, the doctrine of every man for himself. See, a value system that places pleasure as the ultimate goal of life believes, although maybe unknowingly to a lot of people, that life is defined as whoever has the most toys wins. That's consistent, isn't it? See, I agree with John Piper who says that pleasure is totally biblical. But only when God himself is that ultimate delight. He is the ultimate pleasure. And the world's boast that it has cast off the shackles of a puritanical religion is nothing, as you know, but a brand new slavery wrapped up in a disguise of some kind of libertarianism. But there's a, there's a Christian version that's even more pernicious, and it stems from the belief that the future kingdom of God has already come in its fullness. And that God wants to provide you with all the health, with all the wealth, with all the happiness, with all the candy you can carry, this side of the grave. 
I can have my cake and eat it at the same time. Because, you know, God's a miracle-working God. See, the implications of this doctrine, of which I can't say better than John Piper, from the perspective of American culture, let's watch this video for a couple of minutes. I don't know what you feel about the prosperity gospel, the health, wealth, and prosperity gospel, but I'll tell you what I feel about it, hatred. It is not the gospel. And it's being exported from this country to Africa and Asia, selling a bill of goods to the poorest of the poor. Believe this message, your pigs won't die. Your wife won't have miscarriages. You have rings on your fingers and coats on your back. That's coming out of America. The people that ought to be giving our money and our time and our lives instead selling them a bunch of crap called gospel. And here's the reason it is so horrible. When was the last time that any American, African, Asian ever said, Jesus is all satisfying because you drove a BMW. Never. They'll say, Jesus give you that? Yeah, well, I'll take Jesus. That's idolatry. That's not the gospel. That's elevating gifts above giver. I'll tell you what makes Jesus look beautiful is when you smash your car and your little girl goes flying through the windshield and lands like dead on the street and you say through the deepest possible pain God is enough God is enough he is good he will take care of us he will satisfy us he will get us through this he is our treasure whom have I in heaven but you and on earth there's nothing that I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart and my little girl may fail, but you are the strength of my heart and my portion forever. That makes God look glorious. As God, not as giver of cars or safety or health. Oh, how I pray that America would be purged of the health, wealth, and prosperity God, and that the Christian church would be marked by suffering for Christ. God is most glorified in you when you are most satisfied in Him in the midst of loss, not frustration. That's how dangerous it is. We've got to be people of discernment, don't we, in these days? People of the Word people who have, by the power of the Spirit, know what the gospel is and be a discerning people. You see, Isaiah 2-7 tells us that the future kingdom, the future kingdom, will be a land filled with silver and gold. A very physical pictures, aren't they? And there'll be no end to the treasure provided. But to the sober mind and correct our foolish, materialistic, Perspectives in the present day, Jeremiah and Micah will thunder that God has not made the heart for things, but God has made the heart for himself. See, what is literally crazy to the prophets is that they'll point out that trusting in the treasures of wickedness that generates from ourselves is just crazy. More up to our day, John D. Rockefeller, who is considered one of the richest men in the world, who had, a, who had at the time a net worth of over $400 billion, but he also had like a billion dollars in pocket change, was asked this, how much does it take to satisfy a person? Do you know what he said? He said, just a little bit more than he has. You know, talk about a built-in dissatisfaction. Of course, it's insane. See, the answer then to a material life is simply more, more. 
In the US, Chuck Swindoll stated that in the 80s, the average American was exposed to, when you hear this, a whopping 300 advertisements a day, one way or another. That's in the 80s. Fast forward 2021, and although there's no official figures, it's not far off, the average person can now be open to or to encounter between 6,000 and 10,000 advertisements every single day across a range of multimedia. You can see that when you just look at anything on the computer, there's always a list of advertisements everywhere. And what's it all for? It's to make you and me discontent with your present situation. We're pounded every day with the message that you need more, you need better, you need bigger, or even just something novel, you just need it. It would never be stated as brazen as that, of course, but the precise persistence of all advertisement is to generate Envy. The cumulative effects are actually much worse. Millions of layers of advertisements produce bite-sized bitterness, or the potential to produce bite-sized bitterness, layering on top of millions of layers of resentment, so that even in the movie Wall Street, you know, Gordon Gecko could argue for the reasonableness that greed is good. Because money, he says, never sleeps. And so the machinery to encourage dissatisfaction, it has to stay awake just to keep up. Richard Foster says this, that because humanity lacks a divine center, what we would call the lordship of Christ, in every area of our lives, he says our need for security has led us into an insane attachment to things. The lust for affluence in contemporary society, he says, is psychotic. It's psychotic because we've lost all touch with reality. We don't call covetousness sin. What do we call it? Ambition. We don't call hoarding sin. We call it being prudent. We don't call greed sin. We just call it industry. You see, society has been calling us as Christians to itself constantly. Yet our society is sick. And so for us to conform to it is to be either sick are to become sick. As a description of lunacy in modern world, Foster continues, he says, we crave things we neither need nor enjoy most a lot of times. We buy things we don't want to impress people we don't even like. So when Jesus says, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal, He's just stating the most obvious thing in the world, isn't it? It's the ultimate financial bad decision if stuff is God. It is the grace of Christ to awaken us from a slumbering stupefaction. That's what happens, isn't it? Stuff makes us stupid. We may not ask for a Barabbas to be set free, but Gordon Gecko has definitely more than a 50-50 chance. So briefly, number one, Jesus is concerned about our misplaced values. Do not store up for yourselves, Jesus says, treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, thieves break in and steal. Do you notice that firstly his commandment is negative? It's, 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 It's framed negatively. Do not. Which means that the disciples were actually doing this. He's talking about a storing up process and as a practice that must be stopped. You know, as the king in his kingdom, 
from his royal throne declares ex cathedra that the love of wealth is insane. It's a great wickedness. For the love of money is a root of all sorts of evil. And some by longing for it, they've wandered away from the faith. They may still be coming to church, but they've wandered away from the faith. And they've actually pierced themselves with many griefs, says 1 Timothy 6 and verse 10. I know that sounds harsh, but in fact, it's from his kind heartedness. His words, they drip with a compassionate concern that we don't live lives with regret, with, with, with regret. Or for the lives that we have lived are the present ones we're presently living. It's like getting all excited when there's a great sale on, you know, on saddles, when you've absolutely no intention of buying a horse. It's just that craziness Jesus wants to deliver us from. So the Christian responsibility, by the way, of providing for family, that's not what Jesus is talking about here. Because Paul's going to say if anyone doesn't provide for his own, especially those of his household, he's actually denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 8. Now don't get me wrong. Everything created by God is good. And nothing is to be rejected if it's received with what? Gratitude. To who? Well, to God. Thankfulness and joy. See, Jesus is not a killjoy. He's not calling us all to live in a monastery somewhere. He's not a killjoy. So it's fitting that Paul puts the meaning of stuff in its rightful place. When he tells Timothy, instruct those who are rich in this present world not to be conceited and or to fix their hope, fixing their hope on the uncertainty of riches, but on God who, who richly supplies, who richly supplies us with all things to enjoy. That's wonderful, isn't it? So for his disciples who must not lay up treasure for themselves on earth, we have honestly got to ask ourselves where our heart is. Is our hearts entangled in earthly treasure? Maybe without knowing it really and being more aware of it. But this verse prohibits being covetousness, isn't it? He's speaking to misers. Hobbies and habits are all about hoarding. But he's also talking about materialists who can't get no satisfaction along with Mick Jagger and is dedicated to the school of more's better and he's willing more and more to become owned by the very things accumulated. It's kind of like you may be the creator of the stockpile but you become created by the very stockpile you desire to create. Simple fact is this, and it's obvious by now, isn't it? Treasures on earth are momentary. To sell out to stuff is to place your security in that which is by its very nature, it's limited and it's inadequate. You know, it's a self-inflicted blindness. Jesus gives us... He gave us a parable. It feels like a train wreck you just can't turn away from, and yet in some way we're just strangely enticed. The land of a rich man was very productive. He began reasoning to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said to, him, to himself, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns. I will build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain, all my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have many goods laid up for many years to come. Take your ease, eat, drink, be merry. But into this personal planning session, God interjects with a kind of like a sidebar. You fool, this very night your soul is required. 
of you. And now who will own what you have prepared? The conclusion of Jesus is obvious, isn't it? So is the man, he says, who stores up treasure for himself and he's not rich toward God. It says Luke 12. You see, God had blessed him. He knew that. And the man's question was actually perfect. What shall I do since I have no place to store my crops? It's a good question. But when he put I and my at the center, it inflicts, definitely inflicted him, inflicts everyone with a judgment that no amount of wealth can save us from the requiring of our souls. Thieves, Matthew is going to say, other wear moth and rust. Thieves could break in. You have to secure what you have. Literally, it, this word break in literally means dig through because the houses are mud, brick walls. and So they're breaking through, they're digging through your walls and they're stealing. There's more time spent thinking and talking and paying for insurances and just about anything else these days. So basically what Jesus is saying is don't be trusting in your stuff. Secondly, is your heart committed to heavenly treasure? Store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroy them, where thieves do not break in or steal, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Someone had said heavenly treasure is exempt from deterioration and robbery. So Luke 12 will say this for, to us, all disciples, sell your possessions. See, why was he called to sell them? Because they were a part of the heart. Sell them, give, them all, give it all away to charity. Make yourselves money belts which don't wear out. Do you see the principles Jesus is talking about? An unfailing treasure in heaven where no thief comes near nor moth destroys. So what is then heavenly treasure that he calls us to store? Well, you'll get an answer when you ask yourself this question now. Is what I'm doing, does it have a flavor of that which is of good and eternal significance, that's a great criteria, isn't it? And comes out of what you're doing right here on earth, says Donald Carson. So I want for us, as we close out our last couple of minutes, it's so important, we have to do an anatomy of really what a good deed is. First, you have to ask yourself, is it centered in Christ himself? Colossians 2 Verse 2 to 3, Paul wants the brethren to know how great a struggle he has on their behalf and so, uh, so that their hearts may be encouraged, having been knit together in love, attaining to all the wealth that comes from the full assurance of understanding. Wonderful, isn't it? This is what he calls real wealth. He said, it results in the true knowledge of God's mystery. What is that? This is what he says. That is Christ himself. Are you listening? In whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. See, what he's saying is, without Christ being the center of the heart, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, nothing has any real eternal significance for his glory. Did you get that? Is it centered in Christ himself? The second thing to ask is, is it centered in the gospel of the kingdom? Isn't that what we're going through now in this, in this sermon? In Matthew. See, the kingdom, that is the rule and the reign of God over all stuff, including us. Jesus says it's like this. It's like a treasure. That's hidden in a field. And a man, he goes out and he finds it. He's looking all around him and then he hides it again. And from just the sheer joy of finding the treasure, he goes and he sells all that he has. And he buys the field. 
Matthew 13, 44. You see, you can't get away from the teaching of Christ that the gospel of the kingdom must first be lived out here secret place of his satisfaction to our souls and from where our freedom from things must originate to enable us to do this from there it's freedom that governs our whole attitude to blessing others from there we execute the agenda of heaven while we experience Difficult atmosphere of earth. It's always going to be tough. It's never going to be any different. <laughs> we'll never get it perfect. But we can get to the place of a joyful freedom in Christ. You see, to stop us from being philanthropists, Paul says to Timothy, you have to stand guard, he says, through the Holy Spirit. For that treasure entrusted to us. Do you know what he says it is? It's the gospel. 2 Timothy 1 and verse 14. In other words, it's useless. It's pointless. We can't talk about storing up heavenly treasure until the heart is first captured by that which convinces, convinces us our lives are not our own, but that we belong body and soul, in life and in death, to our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, as the Heidelberg Catechism tells us. Lastly then, of course, as an outworking of that, you have to know then what's the heartbeat behind the heavenly treasure. So in order for things to be done that becomes heavenly treasure, treasure they have to be created here out of God's magnificent grace to us see they're shaped from the assurance that our salvation it's already reserved for us in heaven reserved first Peter 1 4 that our confident standing with God it rests on being fully pardoned isn't that right based on the finished work of Christ Matthew 4 Sorry, Matthew 6 and verse 14. Now that even our prayers, all the prayers that he answers, they're not rooted in how good we are and how well we make God's socks go up and down. It's not based on our reputation, but on Christ's reputation. And that our names, your name and my name, it, the ink is already dry. Our names are enrolled in the heavenly scrolls of grace. See, the things that we most highly treasure, they're always going to occupy the heart, for the heart is the center of our personhood, our personality. It embraces your thinking, it embraces your mind, it embraces your emotions, it embraces your choosing, your will. And so therefore, the most cherished treasure, it subtly but infallibly controls the whole person's direction and value. John Calvin said this a couple of hundred years ago. He said, if honor is rated as the highest good, well then ambition must take complete charge of a man. If, if money, then forthwith greed takes over the kingdom. If pleasure, then men will certainly degenerate into sheer self-indulgence. Does that look like anything like the, the modern world we live in? Hendriger and Kiss, Kissmaker said this, naturally, if a person's real tre treasure, his ultimate aim and his striving is something pertaining to this earth, that is the acquisition of money or fame or popularity or prestige or power, then his heart, that is the very center of his life, will be completely absorbed in that mundane object. All of his activities, including all the so-called religious ones, they're going to be subservient to this one goal. It's quite profound, isn't it? So Don Carson says, those who set their minds on things above are determined to live under kingdom norms. What we've been kind of preaching about these days and talking about these days, they'll discover at last that their deeds 
follow these norms. Brothers and sisters in Christ, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. How's your heart? But also, where's your heart? We know that we can't be at two places at the same time physically. And Jesus is going to tell us spiritually, the heart can't be in both of these places at the same time. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your son. I thank you that the real prosperity that's eternal is Christ himself. Every blessing we have experienced, everything we have, we know didn't come from us, but we've received it as gifts from you. And therefore, in many ways, everything you've given to us, you've given to us as stewards, entrusted with all kinds of things, not just financial, not just material, but time, things of the heart, the words that we say, your intentions behind them, that's the real prosperity we know. That's what brings glory and honor to you. This is a difficult day we live. It's so easily easy for the, the modern church to be compromised in many ways and easily led astray because we are not people of your word and therefore our discernment shrinks with that. Lord Christ, you are everything. You have done everything for us. And I pray, Father, for each of us in this church, we would, find, we would be found to be servants of the King. In your kingdom, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. And we're just going to have a closing song, and then I'll come back with the benediction.
follow Jesus, for he has said that he will bring me home. And day by day, I know he will renew me until I stand with joy before the Thank you for that closing song. I just want to um, close us with a benediction that's, I think, fitting for us, fitting for us this morning. It's in 2 Peter, if I can just find it. And this is what he says. Let's have our heads bowed. It's exactly what we need. Brethren, grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. For to him be the glory, both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. Brothers and sisters in Christ, let's love one another.